Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody. This is Howard Fox, and welcome to another episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Our guest today is Denise Bossert. Denise is a poet and photographer whose passion is writing, nature, and abstract photography. She enjoys teaching mixed song contemplative photography workshops and going on photo shoots to discover the extraordinary in the ordinary world. She teaches and photographs near her home in Texas. Denise is also the author of the teen and adult paranormal and urban fantasy series, The Grace Bishop Novels. Her first novel in the series is Glamorous, followed by two novellas, Return and Beginnings. Denise Bossard, welcome to the Success Insight Podcast. Thank you so much, Howard. It's great to be here. Denise, I really have to admire, I mean, you've got the J-O-B, You've got this passion for photography, which I totally appreciate because that's how I paid my way through school many years ago. And you're also an accomplished writer of a fiction work. So I would love just to get a little bit of a background about you just to create some context for our, our listening audience. So how'd you get started at all this? Well, I've always been a writer. Back when I was in elementary school, I was doing short stories and writing poetry and really doing a lot of reading and writing at that time. And then it got busy with school and didn't do a lot of writing until I got further along into the (laughs) J-O-B. And then, you know, my dad had given me one of his old cameras and I started doing more photography and started picking up into that. And a friend of mine actually started writing a novel. He was between jobs and he started writing a science fiction novel. And we started doing what we call novel club. Every week we'd meet and he'd send me part of his chapters and he would ask me to help him out on his novel and ask him questions. And I was like, I've never really tried to do anything like that. I've always written short work. So I wonder if I could do that. And it came to me in a dream when I wasn't feeling so hot one day and kind of when you're too tired to get out of bed, but not enough energy to go out and do anything. So I was kind of laying there thinking about stories and came up with this idea for a book. And eventually I, I started working on it on the side with encouragement of my friend and it kind of wrote itself eventually, as they sometimes say, some authors talk about how the characters take over and write the book. That's kind of what happened to me. Oh, wow. So I, I, with his encouragement, continued to go through. He self-published and eventually was picked up by Amazon. And I thought, well, if he could do it, I can do it. And so I just, I kept going until I finally was able to self-publish it and It was quite a journey, but I'm really excited to have the book out there and have gotten a lot of good feedback and it's been a lot of fun. Well, that's fantastic. I am curious. uh, I want to go back just a bit to when you were helping him write the book. You had said with the uh, the novel club that he asked you to ask him questions. Right. If anything was unclear or it didn't make sense what the characters were doing or where the plot was going, just anything about the story, he wanted me to ask him so he could think about how to make it better. Okay. Now, was... Did you also use that technique for for your own work as you were uh, developing and writing Glamorous? Unfortunately, he got sick by the time I started really writing. So he wasn't able to work with me on my novel in the same way. But my process really was being a visual person, being that photographer, what I would actually do is sit and visualize each chapter and what was going on in the chapter, like a movie in my head and seeing what the characters would do, what they would say and think about what made sense for this character in this situation. And I kind of have that whole scene played out in my head and then I would go and capture it by writing it down. So I did that as my process sort of independently. And then I got connected with some development editors that I worked with that really took my story to the next level. So with the, these development editors, how did you go about finding them to assist you in this process? I had listened to some podcasts that were available 
for new authors and for selling books as an independent publisher and found a podcast by two editors that were writing about how to write and, and what they would do to edit. And they actually had a podcast where you would send in a chapter of your book, they would edit it and then talk about the edits as far as the podcast. So I found them fairly early when they were doing that and I offered up my chapter to them and they made that one of their podcasts. And then I liked what they had done so much from the editing perspective. I asked for their help and we kind of formed a relationship from there. Well, that's fantastic. You know, I have not heard this approach before. And, and well, first, I had not heard the approach of when you were working with your friend who was writing his book, of just kind of asking questions. So that's very interesting. And again, it's the first time I've heard this. And there are thousands of podcasts out there. And, and I know some of them are about authoring your book. And the one you've just described is, again, it's very interesting. I've not heard that approach before, but I think it's marvelous that, you know, if you're not inside, say, like a community, you know, the, the novel club, so to speak, and there's a lot of authors who get together with other writers and they, they sit and talk about their books and are there to provide feedback when, when asked. But I love the fact that this podcast was out there. Their purpose was to help authors write their books and you know you submitted your your chapter. Uh, it's fascinating, and it's like that gives me hope. I can go out and write my own book again. I don't. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing is with writing a book as a self published author. It, it's a long haul, but it's a lot of fun too. You just really need to hit the fine points to be successful. You need to obviously have a good story, and that's where development editors can really help you out. You want your story to be free of errors. So you're going to get an editor that's going to help proofread and line edit your work. And I did both types of edits for Glamorous. And then, of course, you want a good cover. And I did a competition group sourcing of my crowdsourcing of my cover on 99design and got a cover I love. Um, and then you need to figure out how to get it published out on Amazon. and then try to do some marketing. And when we started back when my friend started in 2012, there, it was a very different landscape at that time. But now there are so many websites, so many training, so many Facebook sites, so many groups that you can connect with and groups of authors that can support you and help you understand what the process is. So it's a lot easier to learn how to do it. But at the same time, there's a lot more people who are doing it. Excellent. I would typically ask this at the end of the podcast, or towards the end of it, it. But you know, we're kind of talking about this. You know, we're the way I look at it. We're kind of building a, a following a recipe, which then leads to the final product, which is your book. So now that you've gone through this process of, you know, you've got the idea, you've got the uh, the, the the development editors, the proofing, the the uh, the line editors, the the, crowd, the sourcing of the cover, and I love the fact that you use ninety nine designs and you help you crowdsource your cover because that is absolutely brilliant. I mean, if I could go back and I could with my own book, I, I think it's fast. I think it's wonderful that that you have a, a cover that's it's very unique. Because sometimes there's a lot of uh, bespoke covers out there and. My my worst fear came when my best friend said, Howard, I found another book that had the same cover as yours. And that was embarrassing. But no, I love oh, yeah. uh, I love the covers. What would you say have been the lessons learned now uh, of this whole writing process? If you could go back and say to yourself, you know, Denise, back in 2012, or even before when, when this idea was just kind of, a, uh, it was just a co contemplating, I want to write a book and it, there wasn't a lot of substance there. What would you, what would you say to yourself way back then that maybe would have put you on a different track to get this work done? I don't think I would have changed much about the process that I went through. Cause I, I liked how the story came out and I liked my cover. I really appreciate how it all came together and the response I've gotten has been really great, but I have to 
give some credit to my husband because he did say this when I was getting ready to publish this book because my husband is an avid reader. He has Kindle Unlimited and he breaks the bank with those folks because he reads. (laughs) It's incredible. Um, And he did read my book. He hated the ending because it wasn't, he's a sci-fi guy and I'm a fantasy writer. And so we had to agree to disagree about my ending, but he said, you should wait to publish your book till you have more books to publish. Now that's oh, wow. awful hard for a first time writer to do. And let me tell you, I slogged through this book. It was hard to write for me. And you know, some people, it seems like it's really easy for them to write, but for me, it was my first novel. It was really challenging to get it to all come together. More challenging than school ever was the degrees I earned. It, but he was right because what we've seen as things have evolved that the self-published folks that have three, four, five books, they're incredibly successful and the books tell each other. And so I have learned that that probably should have been the better way to go. But life circumstances were such that we had been one of those folks that Texas flooding is a real thing and we had gotten hit with flooding. And I just, right after I got the book back from the editor, we got flooded and I thought, you know, This will keep me sane to work on the book, but I just couldn't put it together to get the next book another another made while we were dealing with life stuff. So that's regret, you know, in in some ways that I I didn't spend more time writing more books. But at the same time, I'm really proud of what I did get done and I plan to write more in the future. Sure. You know, and I have to, I guess, offer, I'm glad you wrote the book. I mean, you never know when life is going to take a, a turn and, you know, events happen, things happen. And, you know, and, and by the way, I can't imagine uh, this book was harder than writing your, your uh, doctoral thesis and, uh, or doctoral dissertation. Uh, but if I it was... Wa- <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my. Well, you know, the funny thing is, you know, probably when you had to defend your dissertation, you're, you're kind of having to defend your book too, and the story of people asking you questions. What do you, you know, what did you mean by this? What did you mean by that? And so th- I think was that, that questioning was that, did you find that was, well, that was very similar to when I got my, my PhD is, and I have having to defend my work. I'm having to defend why I'm doing what I'm doing, especially when you're working with the development editors and the proofers. Yeah. When I work with the editors, I, came into it thinking, I know these are professionals. They do this all the time. They know what they're talking about. And I want my book to be better. So the development edit, it was hard to hear. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, I want to do this. You're telling me things that I can see are going to make it better. It's just going to be hard for me to implement, but I'm going to do it because I know it'll make the book better. And boy, did it. Now my proofreader, line editor, I picked someone who was pretty sarcastic because I thought that would be good for me and my personality. But, and when you get your manuscript back and there's no sentence that doesn't have at least one or multiple red marks in it, that's pretty daunting. But again, my attitude was, this is something that's going to make my book better. Now, I did not agree a hundred percent with the development editors or my line editor proofreader. Most of the time, I would say probably 98% of the time, I said, yep, that makes sense. It makes it better. But there's a few things as an author. I said, nope, you didn't quite get what I was wanting to do there. So I either had to make it clearer or just say, nope, that's my decision. Um, The best part about the proofreading is when I got to a point in my manuscript after all this red line and marks, there was a little image that she had dropped into the manuscript it was the sitcom character and he had this huge expression like he was totally shocked on his face and she put i was not expecting this that was the highlight of the experience with the editor that my editor read my book to that level of criticism and she didn't see that part of the book coming. It was awesome. Oh, wow. Uh, did you save that little piece of uh, the edit? Oh, yeah. I saved, I, I saved all the uh, editing as a, a backup copy. But I, I did that and I shared that out with everybody. <laughs> what? This is what my editor said. That means it's really good. 
I have to ask you, maybe this is a, re- this is a request because I, I find that in the podcast, when we produce the show notes, at least on our, on our main website, successinsightpodcast.com, when we take our, our, our podcast and we provide the show notes, backlinks to, you know, Amazon, the webpage, but we also oftentimes have pictures, images shared with us to provide some context either to the book itself or to the the event of publishing a book. And so I guess I would request if you're up for it is scan that if you can scan or take a picture of that couple of those pages with the red marks and let's let's share it on the uh, part of the, the show notes. I think that'd be fantastic. Sure, that'd be fun. So I, I also wanted to share with you, I'm glad you wrote the book. I do get it's nice to publish a book when you have two or three others right behind. I mean, God knows George R. R. Martin is probably never going to get done with uh, Winds of Winter and Dream of Spring. But the fact that you've done it, you've accomplished that goal, and now you can almost say, hey, I've done this. It's not so bad. I'm ready to do the next one now. I think it's wonderful. You can kind of look at it as a woman who's had a child and now she's, do you want to go through that pregnancy again? Because that's kind of what it felt like is giving birth to your your book, you know. I have lots of ideas for the next novels in the series. I've got ideas for young adult novels. I'm working on a nonfiction self-help. You know, the problem is I have so many ideas and finding the time to do them. That's always the challenge as a writer. There are stories that keep coming and you've got to figure out which ones you want to invest your time in and make the most sense and inspire you. That That's the thing is I, I was trying to write an, another novella and started working with this character and thinking about it and I kept working on it and it I finally said you know what this has got to be another novel it's just there's too much going on I can't wrap it up in a real short novella so I had to switch to another character to focus on a novella and we'll, we'll add that to the list of novels that I need to write that's fantastic and by the way I don't know if you've gone back to some of our earlier podcasts and listened to some of them but I have on multiple occasions equated the writing of a book to birthing a baby. Yep. It's, so I was like, I, I totally get that. And I'm a guy. <laughs> so <laughs> visualize that. <laughs> let's talk about the books now. So the, the first book is glamorous. Give us a kind of a high level uh, description for our audience. What is glamorous about? Sure. Howard. So it's about a 20 something year old lady she used to be a police officer but she got in a bad accident and in that accident her younger brother was killed and she was seriously injured and spent a lot of time in the hospital and when she came around after the accident she started to realize that she was able to see and speak to ghosts she had gained these supernatural powers and then she had to figure out what to do with them so the story starts after she had that experience well, the, the experience themselves are captured in the novellas, but the main novel, Glamorous, starts when she's already switched jobs and she's a security person now and she does private investigation. Her brother, who had died, came back as a ghost and is living with her and spending time with her. But a friend of theirs approaches Grace, the main character, and asks for help. Because he's noticed that the young girls, the homeless girls that he's working with, are disappearing. And the police won't help them. They figured that these girls are just going home or going to another city. But he knows these girls and he knows something's wrong. And he asked her for to help. And so she starts to do the research and the investigation. And it turns out that there's a serial killer who's preying on homeless girls and prostitutes. And she's got to figure out how to know who this guy is and stop him. And it turns out she's going to have to use both her cop skills and her supernatural skills because this guy isn't just a normal human. He's got special powers as well. So the story Uh evolves to say, well, how is she going to figure out who it is? How is she going to fight him? How is she going to protect these young girls and these women? And you get to meet a lot of different characters along the way that are her friends. She discovers that there is a whole subculture of people like her in the city. And there's a family that is sort of like 
it's not a crime family, but it's similar to a crime family that kind of runs the subculture. And so she has to negotiate that new world with her new powers to figure out how to work in both the human world and this paranormal group as well. Okay. So the, the new culture is, as you call them, like the paranorms or. Yeah. Okay. Now with glamorous, the book is, is kind of self-contained and the character, the, the book starts with characters already had the accident. And then you went back and you created these, these novellas, you know, 40 some page novellas return and then beginnings. Um, had you set out to do that or that did that become just like a natural next step for you short of just going out to do part two of the, of the uh, Grace Bishop novels? Yeah, it came sort of naturally, I guess. I went, I'm not it's hundred percent natural. I wanted to go on to the next book. I actually had storyboarded the second book in the series when we got hit by flooding and Again, life being what it was, it was pretty crazy for a while, and I wanted to do some writing. That was a good creative outlet for me and a healing for me to do that. So I didn't, again, have the energy to do a full novel, but I was wanting to write, and I got curious to say, okay, I kind of started after the accident. Well, what happened at the accident? What happened with Grace? How did she figure out how to use her powers and deal with her powers. Okay, I could write a novel about that. And then I was like, well, her brother Danny came back as a ghost. Why would he come back? Why would he want to help her and come back to her when he had died? And so I thought that's an interesting story as well. And what's fun about these novellas is you get to share with the reader things that happened that maybe even the characters weren't aware of that Grace doesn't know why Danny came back a hundred percent, but you get to know as a reader because they show it to you in return. And there's things happening in both the novellas that the, the Grace doesn't realize and he doesn't see and doesn't understand, but the reader gets ex- exposed to all that and gets a lot more to understand what happened. And that's the fun part of the writer you get to share things. That's what I'm doing in this next novella is you get to meet another major character in the book before the main novel started, but it's, it's the backstory on this other character that involves Grace as well. So it's fun to give the reader more without Grace knowing that the reader knows that. Well, that's very interesting. So not you, so you have a, a third novella that's being worked on right now. Yes. Okay, and when will that be out? When do you think? Probably early next year. Okay, okay. Now, will these novellas take the place of having a full-on novel? Because I think it's actually a really interesting approach. I have not seen this before. Is it new? It's pretty common in the fantasy, particularly the urban fantasy, that you write uh, these side plots that give you insight into the world that you're in. And particularly, readers are interested in some of the minor characters that maybe don't have enough to make a whole novel out of them, but they're interesting in and of themselves. So that a lot of the authors that I read in fantasy and some sci-fi, they do this, and it's a lot of fun to have a, a, a little bit more background on those characters and get insight into those characters. It seems to enrich the general world building that you have. So they're supplemental, but they're not meant to replace the next novel that's going to be written. Okay, very interesting. Now, I, I have never encountered this before, so I, I found it fascinating as I was starting to read some of the reviews. And, and speaking of the reviews, I mean, you, again, you've, you're an accomplished technical expert in your J-O-B, uh, accomplished photographer and poet. And what has been the reaction to these novels, the, the Grace Bishop novels? What, what, what's been the reaction from the reading community? I think that folks really enjoy the books. What's exciting to me is the number of people that have left a review that say, this is not my normal genre for reading, and either they picked it up because a friend mentioned it or um, that they saw it and, and like the cover or whatever the reason is that they decided to pick up the book. A lot of folks have told me it's not 
my genre, but it was such an interesting story. I, I gave it to a friend and she was going on a trip and she says, well, it's not usually what I read. I said, okay, we'll go ahead and try it. And she said, I couldn't put it down. I read it the entire trip <laughs> to get from, you know, starting to the destination. It was great. It was a great story. And so that's what really excites me is that that shows that the story carries itself beyond the normal genre that people would read, that people can find it interesting because the characters are interesting. They're engaging. You get caught up in their story. And that's a real win for me that they love the characters. Now it's fun to see the reviews and certain people like certain characters. So some people really think Grace is kick ass and she's this great, strong woman. And then other people like Danny, her brother. So everyone has their favorite. Now I did get a review by an Amazon reviewer who reviews a lot of books and I had reached out to her to give her a free copy and our copy and see if she would be willing to review it. And when she reviewed it, she did not like the fact that this real snarky character at the beginning changed. And she really was pretty strong in her opinion. <laughs> and that was my first big review. And it was really hard to deal with that she came down pretty hard on my writing. But at the same time, it's like, well, I felt this character was the one that grew the most almost in the book. That was the whole point for him to change. And, so it was hard to hear someone give that kind of harsh criticism. And I went to my author online community and they're like, don't respond. Just that's what happens. You're going to get those reviews. Just move on and focus on writing the next book and, and doing what you need to do. So the reviews can be scary when you're a first time author and seeing this come through. But after a while, you get kind of used to everyone has got their opinion but enjoy the ones that are sharing things about your book that they really enjoyed. The book deals with homeless girls. And I had a reviewer who said that she was very nervous to start the book because her husband had been homeless in the past. And she was really afraid of how I would handle dealing with uh, homelessness in that situation. And in the end, she said she was really pleased. I did a great job. I was really accurate. And she was really happy on how that turned out. So that made me feel really good. You, you don't realize how you might touch people with some aspect of your story. But that made me feel good that I did a good job to represent that. Fantastic. If you were going to give some advice to someone now that's just done that pre-contemplative phase or that they know they want to do something with a book. They're not quite sure. Maybe they, they, they want to sit down and start writing. I mean, we're coming up to the end of the year. That's when we all make our new year's resolutions. I want to write a book. I want to write a blog. I want to start a podcast. What would your advice be to that individual to about setting off on this journey to become an author? What would that advice be? I have a few things I would probably tell them. One is go for it. You absolutely have to try. No matter how far you get, you've got to put your effort into it, especially if it's a story you've been thinking about a while and it's just something that's there pushing you to write it down. Go for it. I would say that you need to decide at the very beginning what genre you're going to pick because those genres are very different. We know from reading them that those genres are very different. They have different plot structures, different types of characters, different world building. So decide what genre you want to use, what you're going to work with, and it probably should be one that you've read a lot in so that you know how those stories go, you know what good writing is in that genre. That's what you really want to do is have a lot of reading under your belt. And then I think you need to look at story structure and how to develop story structure. My friend that I worked with with Novel Club, he read a book, and I eventually read it and used it called Save the Cat. And it's about screenwriting, but it talks to you about the different beats in the story, and you can translate that into a novel as well. So that was really, for me, what helped me structure the overall story and the story arc and what should happen at what point in the story. So Save the Cat's a great book to read. And then there's uh, The Story Grid, which you can go online and you can look at it and you can see how you build the story structure and how you develop characters. So there's a lot of prepping 
around how am I going to write this? How am I going to structure the story that you need to really read a lot about before you jump in and start putting down the chapters? So that would be my recommendation. You need to read a lot in the genre you want to work in. And then you need to look about story structure. And then you just need to sit down and start writing and start playing with it. There's two ways of writing. There's the one where you've got your cork board and every chapter is laid out on a note card and everything's planned. And then there's folks that go and they just sit down and they write. So I'm kind of in between. I, I like to structure using the cork board and the note card so I know overall what's supposed to happen. But like I talked about earlier, I'm a visual person. So once I kind of know, okay, this chapter is about this, I'll sit down and let the story go. And, and I had instances where I got to the end of the book and I'd be like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. That's why I wrote that in the first quarter of the book. It comes back here. It's amazing. You know, writing, the book writes itself sometimes. So that's what I would say is go for it. Know your genre. Get some experience working with story structure. And if you can find a group of people to share that with and work with that'll support you, then you're on your way. That's fantastic. And, and great advice. And I truly appreciate that. And I know our audience will appreciate that as well. So, Denise, before we uh, come towards the end of the show, uh, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where's the best place for them to go to do that? You can find information about all my sites on my Amazon author page. Just look for Denise Bossert, and there'll be links there to my Grace Bishop website and my Grace Bishop Facebook site. Fantastic. And, and to our listeners, we will provide all those links to the uh, website, Facebook page, and to Amazon Uh, on the show notes uh, on our podcast page. Now, just a little special gift for all of you listeners before we sign off today with Denise is we kind of asked her, would she gift us with just a little reading uh, from the book and uh, we'll let her set up the context and we're going to enjoy the reading. So Denise, take it away. So I decided I would read the second chapter of the book. It's a shorter chapter but it's about the bad guys. So I thought it might be interesting for the listeners. So chapter two. Okay. Robin sat in his darkened apartment. He tried to make himself as inconspicuous as possible while Gustav paced the room. The single light from the adjacent kitchen threw Gustav's movement onto the wall as a large dancing shadow. What happened tonight? Gustav demanded. What went wrong? Robin shrunk further down into the chair, but there wasn't any way he was going to escape Gustav's anger. I don't know, Robin's voice trembled. I did everything I normally do. I drove to one of the places you recommended, and it started just like all the other times. I got a great spot to watch the girls, and I found one just like you hoped, one with emerald green eyes. I even had her right up to the car. It was so easy. So easy, Gustav moved to tower over Robin, his nostrils flaring. Then why didn't you bring the girl to me? That is our bargain, little Robin. Robin squirmed under Gustav's livid stare. There there was a boy, he said, his voice barely audible. A boy, Gustav snarled as he placed his hands on the arms of the chair and leaned in to hover inches from Robin's face. Yes, Robin's whole body trembled as the closeness reveals Gustav's protruding eyes and mottled skin. So you panicked. Gustav said, his voice a deep growl. Robin nodded, not trusting himself to speak. And then you ran. Gustav's hands tightened on the chair's arms, causing the wood to creak under the pressure. Robin willed himself to be still, blinking rapidly as sweat ran into his eyes. Gustav needed him, needed him to find and bring him the girls. He just needed to offer Gustav something that would calm him down. I can go out again tomorrow, try to find another girl. Imbecile. Gustav threw his hands up and turned to pace the room. This was the last night of the cycle. We won't be able to look for another girl until the next cycle begins. I'll do it next time, I promise, Robin said, his words rushing out. I won't let anyone get in the way. Gustav stopped his pacing so his back was to the light of the kitchen. His shadow fell across Robin, his body motionless except for his fists, which clenched and unclenched as his ragged breath slowly calmed. 
Robin sensed he was out of danger for tonight, but just in case, he repeated himself. I promise. Next time I'll get the girl. Chapter two. Oh my. Oh my. So if that doesn't make you want to go out and get this book, I don't know what will. So thank you so much for gifting us with a, a reading from the book. We truly appreciate it. Thanks, Howard. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you about my book. All right, folks, we have just been listening to Denise Bosser. She just did a short reading from her book. And again, she has really laid out what it has taken to to produce this book and the steps along the way and the journey she has taken. And this is going into some areas we have not even covered before with a lot of our other authors who are either self-published or going through a publishing house. So really, there's, a, there's some nice lessons to be learned here. And uh, we hope you all appreciate that. So Denise is is a poet and photographer, and she is now the author of the Teen and Young Adult Paranormal and Urban Fantasy series, The Grace Bishop Novels. And her first novel, once again, is Glamorous. And this has been followed by two novellas, Return and Beginnings. And we know that there is a third novella in the works as we speak. So do go out to Amazon or to Denise's webpage. And again, we're going to provide the links uh, to that on our show notes and pick yourself up a copy of Glamorous and the novellas. And as we say every day, where every podcast, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there and have a phenomenal day. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.